I remember sleeping on this, these people's porch and I was, took their cushions off of their chair to try to cover up and it was so cold, like I didn't know if I was gonna make it or not. I became homeless and um, I lost everything I had and, um, and I slept outdoors for several years. Combat came home with us deep inside of us, but we try not to let people see it. In the two years that we were homeless, it was hell. Nothing about it was comfortable. Nothing about it was safe. One of the popular legends of U.S. culture is that the lives of most people look like a 1950s sitcom, where everyone gets the benefits of a stable family and a happy home. Inside these nice, neat houses, babies are born to smiling mothers. Proud fathers go to work each morning and cannot wait to return to a home-cooked meal. Little girls play with dolls in their bedrooms. Young boys go fishing with their dads on summer afternoons. When children grow up, they get a steady job or go off to school. Then, when they are ready to provide for themselves and a family, they get married, buy a home, and live happily ever after inside their own white picket fence. The legend of the white picket fence does not give any real explanation for how two and a half million people experience homelessness in the United States each year. Instead, the perception that every person gets to live inside a happy home encourages stereotypes and half-truths about the more than 600,000 people who have no safe place to lay their heads on any given night. In most people's minds, the classic picture of a homeless person is a single adult male who chooses not to hold a job because he prefers to live off the charity of others. Homeless people are imagined to be summer panhandlers standing on the side of city streets. They are thought of as free-spirited train hoppers, romantically wandering from one town to the next. They are assumed to be alcoholics and drug addicts, criminals as well as thieves, people who are too lazy to work, too drunk to pull themselves out of the gutter, and too irresponsible to care. There's a myth that people who are experiencing homelessness are mostly single men and women, and what we know is that uh, the average age of someone experiencing homelessness is about nine years old. There's myths that everybody who is uh, panhandling is homeless, and the fact is many of the folks that are panhandling are housed. I think the number one myth about folks that are experiencing homelessness is that, especially among single men, that they are drug addicts and alcoholics, that they're lazy, um, that they're thieves, um, that they're pedophiles, uh, and various other and sundry um, negative uh, things. One of the, the major myths that we, we continue to respond to is that all homeless people are going to create crimes when they, when they move in. They're going to create crimes and that they're, they're in those situations that they're in because they choose to be in those situations. The belief that men women and children simply choose to be homeless does not take into account the realities they live in. The homes that lead to homelessness tend to have nothing to do with an idyllic family or a white picket fence. Volunteers and social agents who work closely with the homeless discover several common trends that undermine the ability to maintain stable housing. One of the most consistent contributing factors to homelessness is poverty, including deep cycles of poverty that pass on from one generation to the next. The ability to effectively move from expectation to realization um, of one's ability and excellence is heavily rooted um, in healthy environments of support early on. And those environments of support from a childhood standpoint, are not about the households that one chooses. A lot of our parents enter in with that concept of generational poverty. So we do have families that are entering that I've actually worked with their mother, and now I'm working with their daughters. Because they don't know anything outside of the concept of obtain benefits and that's how you make it. We also see about half of our mothers entering with that educational barrier. So either they have not completed high school, we've seen variations of mothers entering with 
eighth grade educations. Homelessness is often thought of as chronic or long-term, and for a small percentage of the homeless population it is. But in many cases, people experience homelessness for short periods of time on the transitions between stages of their lives. For people who live at or near the poverty line, the loss of a job, divorce, or the death of a financial provider can sometimes make it hard to pay the rent. The recession really disproportionately affected people who weren't uh, making a lot of money to begin with. And so if you're making $8 an hour and your hours get cut, you literally may not be able to pay the rent or you're really forced into making some choices like do I buy medicine or do we pay the rent? Um, you know, do we let the car payment go and if I do that then I can't get to work and then I'll lose my job. I mean, it's it puts people in very precarious positions. In a time of crisis, the divided line between hardship and homelessness often comes down to the support that can be found among family and friends. At uh, first I was living with my brother and, and then he has a handicapped daughter who needed a place so it's better because I enjoy helping people in every which way I can. And so I moved in with my daughter and then her son got a little older and you can't, you, Grandpa can't be living in a house with a teenager. This chapter of my life begins when my husband was uh, diagnosed with brain cancer. And at that time, you know, we didn't have a lot of money because he couldn't work anymore. Immediately when he died, all income stopped. And I thought, I can't keep, I can't keep accruing this rent and owe them all this money. So I told them I'm gonna have to leave. I told them where I was going. I was going to my sister's house. And they sent me a bill with an extra $435 on there. I said, what is this for? I didn't give them notice. I mean, they knew what I was going through and I didn't give them notice and they tacked that I'm still paying on that. My sister's house, I was welcome there, but my nephew, her son, he was a very, he drank, he took drugs, he had a violent temper and went into rages and he put me out. Well, once again, I was homeless. I had my car and it was a station wagon. Now you can't really sit and park anywhere for any length of time. So I've, I went to the laundromats and uh, the library and stuff. And the worst part about it was cleaning up, showering, and going to the bathroom. Along with poverty, another trend found among the homeless is a troubled past. The emotional trauma caused by violence or abuse can result in developmental struggles and coping mechanisms that make it difficult for people to keep up secure housing. If you look at a lot of the studies, and if we look at, if I look at our programs, um, a large number of the residents that end up receiving services from our organization are more victims of crimes than the perpetrators of crime. I'm a victim of domestic violence. It's embarrassing to talk about. I met my children's father when I was 16, and I left him when I was about 28. And, I don't know, life was good until he started drinking. And he got abusive, so 12 years later I left him. After I left him for beating me, my two brothers started beating up on me. So I gave my apartment up. I didn't get evicted or anything, I just gave my apartment up because I couldn't take it no more. Um, in the two years that we were homeless, it was hell. Nothing about it was comfortable. Nothing about it was safe. I grew up with six brothers and no sisters, and it was just me, my mom, and um, this man. Very young, when I was like four, this man um, was creeping into my bedroom from four to 12, and he was molesting me. So that caused a lot of confusion, distortion of my thinking, um, what love is, what approval is, um, what someone caring for you means, and I thought he was my father at the time. So I had all these like crazy feelings that was going on inside, a lot of it from the sexual abuse and the confusion that that brings and like the disgust because I felt like it was me. I didn't understand that it wasn't my fault. I just felt like it was my fault and I was gross and ugh. So like when I drank and when I used, all those feelings went away. So um, why wouldn't I do that? And it's what everybody that I loved and trusted did anyway. So I mean, it just made sense and it worked at the time. And at the beginning it was fun and I enjoyed it, and we all was partying, doing crazy things. I didn't know my life was unmanageable, 
I didn't know it wasn't normal. I thought it was normal. I didn't see a life for myself. I didn't see a future. So I'm out there and I'm trying to make money. So I'm, I'm prostituting, turning tricks, and I have nowhere to go. And it's cold. And I remember sleeping on this, these people's porch. And I was, took their cushions off of their chair to try to cover up. And it was so cold. Like I didn't know if I was going to make it or not. I really just wanted to die, honestly. Like I was really trying to die. I was deliberately putting too much dope in my body to die and mad at God because I was still alive. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a condition when someone experiences something that is traumatic to themselves. Um, there aren't set things that would cause anybody to get PTSD, um, but certain things, the way that we interpret them, can cause um, you to, to have PTSD. Oftentimes, because of military service and, and um, military experiences, individuals come back and feel that they can't necessarily share what they've gone through. Um, they're ashamed of maybe some of it, embarrassed that they're struggling with it, um, and tend to not seek the help that they need. And then it also leads them at times to self-medicate and, and do what makes them feel better in those situations. So they'll tend to overuse drugs or overuse alcohol or um, react aggressively. Combat came home with us deep inside of us, but we try not to let people see it. We don't want people to see it and feel like it's a weakness or something. For many years, uh, I drank uh, a case or two cases of beer a day and then I drink some hard stuff once in a while and then I can sleep at night. And uh, some guys, they stay on, they get on drugs. They, uh, you know, just to numb the feelings of the guilt and the uh, different things that they feel at home. There are times when you, uh, you're, you're, you're like a time bomb, a ticking time bomb. And it doesn't take much to set that time bomb off. You, you, you don't want to blow up. You don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. You don't want to say things that hurt somebody. And I've done it to my kids even, you know. Uh, my kids probably have, uh, they weren't in battle, but, they've, but they all probably have a, a, some of the PTSD symptoms that I have. After my divorce, after my wife and I separated, but I lived at the place of business that I was working at down in Columbus. I had a mattress, and when it closed up at night, I was the manager there, and I slept on the floor on a mattress. When we came home, they didn't even have it. They, they didn't know what it was called. You know, they just said, this guy's crazy, man. You know, put him on Thor's and let him go. And uh, that's how they did it. They medicated you to the point. There was one point I was on six 10 milligram th uh, Valium a day, two 50 milligram Thorazine and Librium. And I was a zombie for almost two years of it during that period of time. Many people associate homelessness with addiction, and there is a strong connection between the two. A conservative estimate is that one out of every four homeless people wrestles with a substance addiction of some kind. But that does not mean solving homelessness is as simple as telling people to quit using drugs without first making an effort to understand the chemical imbalances, the past experiences, or the mental health issues that help to create the addiction. Mental illness poses a great challenge, I think, uh, for many individuals to both find housing and to maintain housing. Um, one of the problems is that uh, there is limited income that individuals with mental illness have. Many of them are unable to work, and so they may be on a subsidy from Social Security of some kind. Um, and so there are limitations as to what they can afford. Another major hurdle is that with the mentally ill adult population, there is a large comorbidity of substance abuse. Um, and that can eliminate people from consideration for housing, or uh, at best, um, it makes the stability of housing much more tenuous. I was bipolar, and, um, and I heard voices and all that beautiful stuff. I struggled with um, alcoholism from an early age, but I was able to function. I held a, 
a same job for 22 years and other work also. And then life got stressful for me. I had a lot of emotional things happen in my life and um, I became emotionally, physically bankrupt and um, I became homeless and um, I lost everything I had and, um, and I slept outdoors for several years. I met some people on the street and I went to camp with them at their camp and they camped in the woods behind Vest Memorial on the bike path and, um, and that's where I camped. And, um, and I became accustomed to it. And, but I was on medication. But while I was homeless, you know, I, I did try to work through temporary service and I would get money and, and I would drink and take my medications and, and I was a mess. When you are in the midst of an addiction, unfortunately, the, the drug becomes your best friend, your coping skill, uh, your um, lover, your, I mean, it, it, is, it is all you care about. And at the same time that you're doing that, you're really um, giving yourself very shame-based messages because you know at some level you're not who you want to be. It becomes your entire focus uh, of, of your existence and, and I said big time at the same time knowing you're not doing what's right. So then the trap is to use a little more so I don't have to feel. I've been homeless for about 20 some years due to my addiction. I had a boyfriend that I was with for 15 years and it was an abusive relationship so anytime he'd get drunk or out of money he'd beat me up and put me out so that was my homelessness but um, I guess I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm getting old, going back and forth to jail, you know my kids are grown, I didn't raise them, I have grandkids here now. And I'm still out here in the streets looking stupid, don't know where I'm going to lay my head the next day or what I'm going to eat or what I got to do to lay my head. So um, <laughs> I got in trouble for soliciting. A week later, I jumped in the same undercover's car. So then it's like, girl, you got a problem. And when are you going to realize this? A lot of people want there to be a quick fix for homelessness, a clear path to set someone on, or a single person to blame. But the troubles faced by the homeless run deeper than that. In our society, homelessness is found at the crossroad of individual challenges and a breakdown in family or community. And it does not do much good to tell people who lack a social network or support that they're supposed to just solve all of their problems by themselves. Some percentage of individuals, when they work harder, will be rewarded in the ways that are consistent with the cliche, pick oneself up by one's bootstraps. But there are, there is, there are so many circumstances um, and characteristics that are not rooted in choice, effort, and other factors that warrant respect in the recognition of how economic marginalization happens uh, in this country. The homes that lead to homelessness often hold memories of struggle and crisis. The people who become homeless are children, mothers, fathers, and grandparents. The stories they tell are far removed from any idyllic picture of a nice stable home. Poverty, violence, mental health issues, and addiction permeate many of their lives. Sadly, the prejudices and stereotypes associated with homelessness tend to oversimplify and dehumanize the real people they depict. But the most damaging misconception of all may be the belief that there is nothing anyone can do to help. Personal relationships and community agencies can give people the support they need to turn their lives around. The stories of the 600,000 people who are homeless today are not over yet. All of a sudden I was very ill. I was very sick from my alcoholism and my mental issues and I decided that I wanted to get help. And, and I've tried to get help several times but it never stuck with me. And um, this time around it did. And, um, 
and I went to get help and I seriously wanted it. I had a choice whether to live or die and um, I wanted to live. Now I don't hear the voices anymore, you know. I'm hooked back up and I'm gonna take my medications every day and, um, and it helps me, you know. I feel I'm at peace with myself, finally. It's a never ending battle that goes on day after day after day. It's not something for someone to feel sorry about for someone, but maybe you can become friends with somebody that has that, has the PTSD and, and uh, maybe get them to share with you and then you can be part of the loop that helps them heal. I've worked hard for three years, I have. And um, I work hard every day to stay sober and to help other people and to try to shine a little bit of hope that um, you don't have to live that way anymore. And I've gone through a lot before this point from rapes and beatings and you know being jumped and hurting other people and being robbed and me robbing other people and that whole crazy cycle that I just, I can't even fathom being in today, which is a great thing because I couldn't fathom being out of that once upon a time. Every day, people and communities work together to treat the underlying causes of homelessness. And every day, more people face circumstances that threaten their ability to have a home. Each night in the United States, the sun sets on over half a million people who have no safe place to rest. Beneath the surface, most of these people wrestle with poverty, emotional trauma, mental health issues, or addiction. At first glance, it might seem easy to dismiss the homeless as having brought all of their problems on themselves. But when you get to know their stories, you begin to see that not everyone gets to live inside a white picket fence. Thank you.